So we say, Ein Mavarin ala mitzvot. We don't pass over a mitzvah. So if you are holding the, uh, the, the two loaves, and then the one that's on top, which is closest to you, you put away and then take the bottom one to, uh, uh, to cut and to eat from, that may be a problem of Ein Mavarin ala mitzvot. And therefore, what we do is we would sort of hold the bottom challah a little bit closer to us when we lift them up, and that way it's, uh, it's still closer and no problem of Ein Mavarin ala mitzvot. Okay. What's so special about the bottom one? You have to ask the Ramah. He says for Kabbalistic reasons. I don't understand much about Kabbalah, but that's what he says. Yeah. Can you keep it covered over with the with the bread and nothing, or should you make the bracha mozi also with the bread? Should you okay? The question was asked: Should you keep it covered until just after the bread prayer or should you uncover it before you say the hamotzi? So probably better to uncover it. Bef just before you say the Amot, see, the reason would be I the covering has to be for, for, for Kiddush, and we'll get into a little bit more detail now. But we have another principle of uh, when we say Brachot, it's always of Siyatan. We want to minimize the gap in between saying the Bracha and fulfilling a mitzvah or saying the Bracha and eating the bread. And therefore, anytime, anytime if we have a food, for example, that's inside a wrapper or in a packet or something, we always say open the packet first, have the food ready. So as soon as you've said the Bracha, you can minimize the hefsek. To start to, so the same thing would apply here to minimize the effort, take a couple of first, have the have the challah ready, and then you can uh, eat it. Okay, we'll get more into uh, into uh, challah and, and uh, so the Shabbat in future shirim. Let's go back to kiddush for the moment. So again, we're talking about the fact that the bread needs to be uh, needs to be covered. So we saw there is an idea of yakra de shabta, meaning that it's the honor of Shabbat. You come to your table. Your table is set for for Shabbat for kiddush. That is how we uh, begin the meal. And we don't want anything else on the table, so to speak. That was the Sheilto. Second reason we saw Tosfot said that it reminds us of the man. Just as the man was covered, so too the uh, bread is covered here as well. The Rosh says here a third reason. The Rosh, here quotes the Yerushalmi, source number 18. He says, The Yerushalmi de Kama de Posin Mapa, Kede Shelo Yerapat Bushato, in order that the bread should not be embarrassed. I think this is the most famous reason because everyone learns it in Gat. Right, this is the uh, the reason why Shumugdam, but it's actually from the Yerushalmi. Shumugdam be pasuk, vedinu sheaktim be bracha umaktimin berkat hayayin. Okay, so what does it mean that the bread should not be embarrassed? Yeah, the Yerushalmi, the Rosh explains a little bit further. We don't really think. Oh, elaborates on this a little bit more in a moment. We don't really think that the bread has feelings and is going to you know start crying at the at the, at the table. Sure. Well, the issue is there is a halachic reason. Yeah. Then we have a pre an order of precedence when it comes to brachot. If I have, forget about Shabbat, forget about Kiddush for a moment. If I have a number of different foods on the table and I have to choose which one to eat first, which bracha do we say? So the way we remember it is the acronym of Mimaga Esh, which literally means from the touch of fire. I think we discussed this once in Yilchot Brachot. But that is an acronym for all the different brachot we have. Mi maga esh. So mem is a, so a motzi is the one that comes first. Motzi, barring that, generally speaking, if we say hamotzi, we probably won't say other brachot with the exception of hagafen, because hamotzi, you eat bread, will cover the other foods of a meal. But in general, so hamotzi is the first one, mi maga esh. Then you have mezonot. Then you have gimel, which is gefen, bray pray gefen. Then etz, then adama, and then shako. That is the order. If I'm saying more than one bracha, that is the order I would go in. But you see, Hamotzi comes before Borei Pri Hagafen. So generally speaking, if I'm sitting down to a meal and I have bread and I have wine, again, bread will potter all the other foods that I'm eating throughout the meal, with the exception of maybe your fruit and dessert. We've discussed that before. I refer you to the recording of those uh, shirim, I think volume 12 or something like that. Um, but, but for wine, wine still necessitates its own bracha. So even though I've said bread, I would still have to say a bracha of bread pragafen on, on the wine that I'm going to drink throughout the meal. So normally, I would say the bracha of bread first, and only afterwards, I would say the bracha of wine. Here, the order is reversed on Shabbat because of Kiddush. The reason I'm saying the bracha of bread pragafen first is because I have to say Kiddush, not because that should actually come, come early. So because, generally speaking, the bread would have its bracha first, that's the halachic reasoning, but that's what we mean when we say, so the bread won't get embarrassed, so to speak. That, the, that that is more significant, and that should take priority for the bracha, and therefore we cover the bread, and, uh, and then we say, bray pragafen. Now you'll have noticed, and I said, mi esh, there is another bracha which comes before bray pragafen, and the order would be mizonot as well. So the question is, we'll have to see what happens if I have a kiddush during the day, Okay. So I have a Kiddush in Shul, for example, and I don't have bread. 
but I'm going to eat mizonot food. And so again, the same logic, if the reason is this idea of embarrassment, the same with the, you know, the bread gets embarrassed, the cakes also get embarrassed, so do the crackers, <laughs> right? If I if I uh, should have said mizonot first, but I'm saying hagefen first because of kiddush, would I similarly have to cover the mizonot in the same way that I have to cover the bread? So there are those who say, yes, we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that shortly. But those are the three reasons we've seen so far as to why it is that we cover the chalot, either because of the honor of Shabbat, Either because or because of uh, man or because of the idea of the kadima, the priority in brachot, and that the bread should not see its embarrassment, so to speak. Now, just before we move on, when I go to the end of the show, I'm going to skip for a moment to page. You see where it says machshava, page ninety-one. Okay, um, interesting story here, which is told. I'm sure many have, have heard these stories or, or variations of them, relating to that idea of. Embarrassing the Chalot. Let's have a look at source number 58. This is brought by Rav Monchai Kamenevsky. Uh, he tells a story about Rav Shaga Faivo Mendelovich. The following. He says, Rav Shaga Faivo Mendelovich was the founder of the Chalot. Again, I'm at the bottom of page 91. Once he stayed in Miami for Shabbos at the home of a former student. The man escorted the Rebbe home from synagogue. But when he opened the door, the young man was shocked and embarrassed. His wife, a week's worth of childbearing, the responsibility of keeping home was sprawled on the couch. I guess she didn't know that uh, he was coming he was coming home. The Shabbos table was half set. The dish was placed in a pile next to the Kiddush cup and wine. In front of the head seat were two large chalas sitting. And the custom is to cover the chalas when making Kiddush. As the bracha of a bread normally proceeds that of wine, it's a somewhat mer- metaphorical embarrassment to the bread that is covered during the Kiddush, as we just explained. The student was embarrassed at the state of affairs. He called out to his wife in a somewhat demeaning manner. Please, let's prepare the table in its entirety. Turning to his mentor, he exclaimed, I'm sure that leaving the bread uncovered was an oversight. Everyone knows, he exclaimed, shifting his self-inflicted embarrassment upon his wife, that we must cover the challah before the kiddush. Remendelovitz was annoyed at the man's righteous behavior and turned to him. Over the years, I've heard many problems that people face. Students, couples, adults from all walks of life have entered my office to discuss their personal situations with me. Not once did a challah ever enter my office. <laughs> Suffering an inferiority complex because it was left uncovered during kiddush. Do you know why? Because we're not concerned with the challah. We're concerned with making ourselves cognizant of feelings. We worry about challahs because the goal is to worry about people. How can you embarrass your wife for not covering the challah when the act of covering is supposed to train you in sensitivity? Okay, and you'll see there's a, before that, at page 57, another version, a similar story told in the name of Rabbi Shal Salanta, very famous stories, again, teaching us that there's a little bit more depth behind this idea. The challahs themselves obviously do not get embarrassed. And when we say the challahs get embarrassed, it's meant to teach us if we're concerned for sensitivity about embarrassment of inanimate objects, so to speak. Obviously, let's not make the car tafel, the tafel, the car. Let's care. Let's think about sensitivity. We need to 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 share towards other people, certainly to those uh, uh, to those closest to us, the family, etc. We find this, by the way, a number of places in the Torah where we have this idea of showing sensitivity, so to speak, to inanimate objects. It's always meant as a lesson. It's always meant as a mashal for how we're meant to uh, meant to uh, treat others. Famous example in the case of Moshe Rabbeinu, beginning of uh, Sefer Shmot. We know that when it comes to the makot, so the first three makot, the first three of the ten plagues were... Uh, we're talking a lot about Pesach today. The first three of the ten plagues were not performed by Moshe Rabbeinu. They were performed by Aaron. Aaron uh, why? Because they came from the water and they came from the ground. And Moshe Rabbeinu had to show Hakaratatov, had to show gratitude to the water that had saved him, the Nile, when he was a baby, to the ground that had covered up the mitri that he killed. Right? And everybody asks the question, you know, is the Nile, going, the water, the ground is going to hurt its feelings? Obviously not. The case, the point is training us, training ourselves in the lessons of, uh, of our Karatatov and Midot and sensitivity. Okay, so those are the three reasons we've seen why we cover the Chalot. Now back to page 69, source number 19. We have the other Mishnah Bura, which gives us a bit of a summary. It tells us some of the nafkaminas between these reasons. It says, Batu Bashem Yerushalmi. Okay, that's what we've already seen. Okay, so therefore, as we discussed last week, what happens in a situation where one is one is making kiddush over bread and not over wine? As we saw in the Gemara, and there were certain opinions in the Rishonim that one could choose. If one prefers bread to make Kiddush over challah, uh, ordinarily speaking, we don't do that nowadays. 
It's only in, under extenuating circumstances where one does not have wine or grape juice or uh, uh, the like that one would make challah over bread. But if one is making challah over bread, would you have to co uh, cover it? So according to the last reason we said, they would not be necessary. Um, but if it's because it's because of the so then we would say, and that's what we follow. That that in that case, if it's a zechel aman, then even if I'm making kiddush over bread, I would still have to cover it at the time when I'm say kiddush. Right, this goes back to question that was asked earlier. It's enough, according to all the reasons, to have the bread covered just until I've finished saying Kiddush. In the morning, when we make Kiddush, we require the bread to be covered as well. Okay, so there is a difference of opinion. You see, the Chaya Adam holds that actually, based on the reasoning of Zechel Aman, it would be better to keep the bread covered until after uh, Hamotzi. So people should follow the Minak, but as we've seen, that's what he says. According to the Prima Gadim, you can uncover it already once you said Kiddush. According to the Chaya Adam, you would have to keep it covered until after Hamotzi. That's only according to one reason. According to the other reasons, you could uncover it. And I, I think if you add in the additional factor of uh, uh, the hefsek between the Brahma and Hamotzi, that would be another reason to uncover it. Yeah. The uh, mission word does not talk about covering other foods besides, yeah. well, like, like people put out salads over before and see the common one. And no one talks about, what we're going to come to about his own effort. What do you do about salads? People put out salads. Or worse place. Again, so, so 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 the Pashtun is the simple understanding of the Gemara and the Rashbam and the Sheilto that we've seen is that this idea of Yekra de Shabta, that it's the Kavod of Shabbat not to have the other food. That we say that Puskim said that applies on Friday night. So ideally on Friday night, one should not have one should not have uh, other foods at the table until after until after Kiddush. On Shabbat day, we wouldn't we wouldn't be concerned about. Well, what would have tax? I mean, to the extent that the center of the law probably matters, like why wouldn't you just make Kiddush on Shabbat and Chatzchila? Then you wouldn't have a problem with that at all. Like I'm saying, saying you need to have it, right? Because you, so you, the, you have to cover it because you make on the wine first, right? If you made it the chafila on the bread to begin with, then wouldn't you have a problem? So there are Rishonim who say that you can make kiddush on bread if you prefer, and that's based on what we saw previously oh. and how we how, how we learn that, that command. But there's a, there's a, there's a separate yeah, reason for making kiddush over, over wine that uh, Chazal established wine for a particular reason, and therefore it's a side issue that we have ways of getting around. Yeah. Were there other, were there other questions? Yeah. No? Okay. So, the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, source number 20, Kitzur Shulchan Aruch says, Bekat Borei Minei Mezonot, Kodem Et Gamla Bekat Ayayin. As we mentioned before, the bracha of Mezonot, that also usually comes before Hamotzi, um, uh, it comes before Agefen, sorry, it does not come before Hamotzi, it comes before Agefen, because you can Hamotzi, Shalai Kodem Et Gamla Bekat Borei Minei Mezonot, Velachen, Beshabbat Veyom Tov, Kshemekadesh Al Ayayin, as we've seen, we have to cover the bread. Says the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. So too in the morning you make Kiddush and you need to cover up the Mezonot as well before you, uh, for, for the exact same, for the exact same reason. Now the Tamei Aminagim over here says maybe there is actually a difference because of this maybe relates to Shalom's question. That although mezonot also comes before uh, hagefen, generally speaking, um, in the order of, of uh, brachot, but there's another factor, which is you could, in theory, make kiddush over the bread, but you couldn't make kiddush over mezonot. So therefore, he says we don't have to be concerned. He says um, right, which is a type of mezonot essentially. Says here, you don't have to cover it up. And therefore, he says, since you couldn't make Kiddush over it, you don't need to cover it. You can see at the top of page 71, uh, there's a quote here from Rav Shlomo Zaman Oyabach, which is brought in the Shemrat Shabbat Kilchata. He says that one who's not drinking from the wine at Kiddush doesn't need to cover up anything, any other mezonot or grain products that are in front of him, because yeah, neither reason would apply. Says the concern for embarrassment doesn't apply when one doesn't drink from one who's not drinking from the wine. 
And the reason of commemorating the man only applies to bread, which could be used for reciting Hamotzi. So Rav Shlomo Zalman here is talking about somebody who's standing at a Kiddush. You're not the one who's making Kiddush, but you're standing at the table and jewel somewhere else, and there's only Mizanot in front of you. He says that doesn't need to be, uh, doesn't need to be uh, covered. As we've seen, there are even those who say that the one making Kiddush would not be required to cover up the Mizanot, but there are many who are who follow the Kiddush Shulchan Aruch, and therefore the best practice is that one who's... Um, the one who's, the one who's uh, making kiddush should cover up the mizonot that is uh, that is in front of them. Usually, it's not so complicated. It's just a bowl or something. You take the serviette, uh, the napkin, and you uh, and you cover it up. Um, that's like the situation we had here last week, for example, when we had a. Sometimes you go to somewhere and you have a uh, you have a communal meal, and you have everybody has their roll on the table right in front of them. So you should take your napkin and cover it up in order to fulfill this uh, alacha that we've discussed. All right. What about on to the next topic? Unless anybody has any questions at this point. Okay, next topic, page 72. Now we've made Kiddush, the Kahala was covered, and now it's time to drink. So, how much do we have to drink? Who has to drink from the cup of Kiddush? So, again, this is in the Gemara Narve Psachim, that is the source of many of these, most of these halachot. It says the Gemara, source number 22. Okay, so it seems to be the simple understanding is that the one who makes Kiddush has to drink what we call a Melolugmav. Melolugmav is a cheekful, which is generally uh, understood to be the majority of a Ravit. Um, okay, it's less than a Ravit. Probably uh, just over just over half of a revit. So, so we're talking about something along the lines of a 40, uh, 43 cc or something like that. That is the minimum amount that has to be drunk by the one who is making kiddush. Tosfot here explains number twenty three. We normally drink more than this. Now he's explaining how do we measure this. This amount, we don't really need to measure it. Where we do measure it, this is similar to the shirim that we use on Yom Kippur. One who is ill and is required to drink on Yom Kippur. So we prefer, uh, in many situations, if a person is, uh, for whatever, if a person can drink, you know, however much they need to if they're ill, but in certain situations where they can get by what's called the shirim, that's what we, uh, that's what we go by. And the way you measure that is. He says, If you have essentially a cheek full, if your mouth, imagine your mouth was filled with wine, liquid, whatever it is, and you one one cheek that's full, that's a melolugmav. Less than a vit. That's melolugmav, essentially, that is both cheek fulls. But one cheek full, he says, is going to be the majority of a, a revit. There's just explaining this shear also comes up on Seder night in the amount that we have to drink for the four cups of wine. And this melolog math changes, it changes its subjective based on how much a person's cheek uh, can hold. So the, Shul- the Shulchan Aruch says here, number 24, he says, A person needs to drink from the Kiddush cup, their cheek full. Uh, as we've said, shall revit. That is uh, again the majority of the revit. Again, different ways of measuring and, and, and knowing what this is, but we generally say we generally assume that a revit is about eighty six cc. The way to remember it, the easy way to remember it, is the gematrias. The gematria, of course, is eighty six. So that that's how uh, you remember. Now the chazonish had a different uh, had a different um, approach. In terms of the shirim, it was really based on the nodab yoda, but it's the larger measurements, which uh, which is known as the shir chazonish. If you there, he held that it was about 150 cc. So if you take the gematria of kos hagun, which means a nice town, that's uh, you get to 150. So that's a nice, uh, seem an easy way to remember. But generally speaking, we say when it comes to shirim, this will come up before Pesach as well. Everybody wants to know how much to drink for the four cups and how much matzah to eat, etc. But the Mishnah Barat tells us a principle. He says whenever we have a shir. Uh, that is Doraita, because we say Safik Doraita so it's a Torah requirement for a certain measurement. Then we go by the more stringent measurement, but if it's a rabbinic requirement, then we go by the smaller one. And therefore, um, so, so 86, half of that is about 
uh, so 44 is, is more than half, that's probably enough for Kiddush. Now, why is this the, the amount? This is a, the minimum amount that a person's uh, mind is settled. They feel like they've had uh, they've had something to drink. Um, yeah. I noticed in my at home, most of the cash cups are reviews. It's about 100 cc's, almost all the cash cups. For, for Pesach, it's different. Some people have a larger coaster. So if you have road coast, it's you don't instead of pushing pushing the wine the wine from one side to the yeah. other. Wondering how big your cheek is, you do rov kos, you join Yeah, so by Pesach, it's a little bit more complicated because by Pesach, we say, the Gemara says that you have to drink rov kos. Okay, so the question is, when we say rov kos, do we mean that the kos is just the measurement, the minimum measurement that I have, and so long as rov kos relates to that measurement, and once I've had that measurement, it's enough? Or do I say rov kos means what it sounds like, the majority of the cup, and therefore if I have a bigger cup, I have to drink the majority the majority of that cup, and there's a uh, there's a machloket, and therefore the, the the advice is not to have a cup that is too big on Pesach because otherwise it can get a, get, get a little bit tricky to uh, to fulfill that. Um, so Eighty three is about three ounces, less three ounces, if you say so. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'm not I'm not uh, not familiar with answers, but I'll but uh, we we can look that up. Um, Okay, so in any event, okay, so what we've seen that the amount that one has to drink, one has to drink a certain minimum amount for the kiddush. It's not a, a, a tremendously large amount. And um, what happens if the cup spilt? Uh, one wasn't able to drink it. One said said kiddush, and then then the wine spilt out. Says the Beit Yosef in source number twenty six. He says, kodim kadesh. So interesting. Here he says that if you you were saying kiddush and whatever happens, somebody knocked your arm and the cup spilled, the wine spilled out, you're not able now to drink it. You've already said kiddush. He says you don't have to go back and say kiddush again. He says that which the Gemara said, if you did not have a melon of you have not fulfilled the obligation of kiddush. That means lekatchila. But if it's spilled and you weren't able to, then you don't have to. That's what the Beit Yosef says. Now, well, you, it, it's, it's, it's a bracha l'shav, no? If you don't, if you make a bracha and you don't uh, oh, okay. drink. So that's, so, so that's a good question. So maybe he's talking about a case here where most of it's spilled and you still had a sip, but you had less than a bracha l'shav, and then it wouldn't be a bracha l'shav. Um, but, but, yeah, can you just add more? Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. Okay, but hang by. We'll see. The question is if it's if it's required. Now, the truth is that this this Beit Yosef, what he says, it's quite uh, um, it's a little bit unclear because in the Shulchan Aruch, he said it sounds like he says that you need to then find more or find a different cup and then drink from it. So the Magen Avraham addresses this. He thinks that actually the uh, Shulchan Aruch changed his mind. What he said here on the Beit Yosef, he did not uh, uh, stick with that opinion. He says at the end here in bold. Number 27, In other words, no, you need to bring another cup, you need to bring more wine. It would seem that he has to uh, that he has to uh, drink from it. Um, but like, where, where it starts to get a little bit complicated, like, like in this case, is if you had wine in front of you and then the wine spilled, if you have to bring more wine from somewhere else, so now we get into the question of did your brave bragafin actually cover that? Did you have because Whenever we have a bracha, we, we, we say you, you have in mind whatever whatever is in front of you. You you were holding a cup of wine and you said break prayer guffin. Your intent in saying that break prayer guffin was to drink the cup of wine that I'm holding. Now that cup of wine spills and I have to bring wine from somewhere else. Was that included or not? So if there is another cup of wine on the table or there's a bottle of wine on the table that's in front of you that was there at the time, then we say we assume in the brachot we assume whatever is in front of a person is included in his uh, intent. But if let's say I was I only had the cup of wine in front of me, there's no other there's no other wine in the room. Okay, the wine's in the kitchen next door, and I didn't it didn't cross my mind that there's a possibility that this wine would spill. And I'm saying the bracha it's only on what I have in front of me, and the wine spills, and now I have to go bring the wine from somewhere else. Then I may need to say a new bracha of rei bragafen because I may not have had that in mind uh, in the first place. Um, in any event, it's a good idea to have so it's a good idea to have spare wine just in case this happens. But as we've seen, the Magen Abraham seems to say that you do need to drink from the wine. I 
if, if, if the bracha was said, the Kiddush was said, but the wine was not drunk, we've not fulfilled our obligation of Kiddush. Now, the question is, who has to drink from the wine? Who is the one? If, what if I have the cup in front of me? First of all, you go somewhere, you're a guest in somebody's home, or you're at the table, you're at a Kiddush in shul, whatever it is. The one who's making Kiddush is obviously going to drink. Does everybody else have to drink as well? Or what if the person making Kiddush didn't drink enough? If somebody else drank, could they be Yotzi Kiddush that way? Okay, that's the that's the question. So if you have a look at source number 29, we see the tour. And the tour says like this. He says, or labim. Okay, you're two or more people having uh, eating together. Obviously, if you just have one, there's no question who has to drink, the one making Kiddush. But you have two or more. The person uh, didn't... Uh, the person making Kiddush didn't drink from the wine. Sometimes it could happen. You could be somewhere. The person who's uh, making Kiddush doesn't know the halacha. And now you have a very, very, very small sip that's less than a malonuk mouth. Okay. So they didn't drink. They didn't drink enough. And some, but somebody else who heard the Kiddush drank a malonuk mouth. So we have the opinion of the Gurnim who say no. It's only the person who made Kiddush. They're making it on my behalf as well. Fine. But it's the person who made Kiddush. They have to drink the Melorim. V'kath katav bag, so to the Bahag, another one of the Rishonim. V'kath od, i yishtale v'lotayim v'shatu achlinei. Okay, he says if he forgot and he didn't drink and somebody else drank, maitele kasa achlina um v'alech 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 Okay, then he says they should bring him another cup. He doesn't need to say a uh, yet. In other words, that seems to say. So that is that is the first opinion. That is the first opinion that it has to be the person who made the kiddush is the only one who can drink the melol of mouth. Otherwise, nobody has fulfilled their obligation of kiddush. Now, top of page seventy-five. This is the tour. The tour is the son of the rosh. So he writes. He says Adonia visa. Says my father, the rosh, on it. He says, no, somebody else can drink. Doesn't have to be the person, uh, doesn't have to be the person saying uh, Kiddush. Somebody else can drink the wine, and that is okay. But there is another condition. But somebody has to drink the Melolugmav. Somebody has to drink that minimum share. The fact that two people together drank the amount of the Melolog Mav, that doesn't count. So we have opinion number one is the Gurnim and the Bag, who says only the person who is, uh, or at least the person who's making Kiddush has to drink the minimum shim. Then we have the opinion of the Rosh, who says it doesn't have to be the person who made Kiddush, can be anybody, but somebody, one individual, has to drink that minimum shim. Then we have a third opinion, the opinion of the Ritva, who says, you don't have a single person. Sometimes you be at a place, you have a cup of wine, maybe not the biggest cup, and everybody just takes a small sip. So there's no one person who had by themselves a melolog mouth. But he says, if everybody together, right, and he says, he's not, he's not sure. He quotes Tosfot. This is not the Tosfot that we have. This is a different Tosfot who says that, yes, everybody could join together. So that is the third opinion. Opinion number one is that the Makadesh has to drink a Melolog Mouth. Opinion number two is that somebody has to drink a Melolog Mouth. The third opinion is that everybody together has to drink a Melolog Mouth. Okay? And sometimes you get into extenuating circumstances. You can be a guest in somebody's home. Then people have different practices, different amounts of wine, etc. Um, Do we have any other situation where the person who makes the Bracha is not the one who, fulfill, who actually does the action? Is there, is there such a, a case anywhere else? Yeah, sure. Like, it's like, again, when we're dealing with Birkata Mitzvot, we're dealing with Birkata Mitzvah, because we have the principle of our vote. So it could be that I'm saying a bracha for, for a mitzvah in order to discharge somebody else's obligation, even though I've already done it myself. I'll give you an example. Tkiat Shofar, Shofar, let's say a person stands in shul and uh, says the bracha of uh, Tkiat Shofar and, and, and blows a right, hundred tkiot, whatever it is. But he's blowing. And they're done. But he's blowing. Wait, but at that but at that point, but he's now fulfilled his mitzvah. Okay. He then goes to the hospital, to somebody else's housebound river, and to blow the shofar for them. And he says the bracha again. He's already fulfilled the mitzvah. He's already heard it. He's, he's not obligated to say that bracha himself, but he can say it for the other person because he's because he's uh um 
because he's fulfilling the mitzvah on their behalf. The mitzvah is lishma koshofar. It's to hear the, the shofar, even though he's the one blowing it. That's irrelevant. The point is, who's hearing the shofar? Um, by the way, that's if he's right, if it's for another man who's obligated. Women are not actually obligated into kach shofar, and therefore women should say the bracha for themselves. But that's that's a different issue. Yeah. yeah if they can, the people you're blowing for, somebody should say it instead of uh, Tia or no one else said it. Right, so this is not much. So certainly, it's certainly if, if, if somebody comes to read the Gilead, that to somebody, has to be doing yeah. the Yishul, that whoever he's reading to should say the so by so, so by shofar certainly if it's women because women are not actually obligated because it's a time bound positive time bound mitzvah and therefore if the baal tokea has already fulfilled the mitzvah himself then he shouldn't be saying the bracha for the, one of the women should say the bracha but in general yeah you know, we say it's better for a person can say the bracha themselves but so long as they're all obligated and this is dinner of our if they don't know how or they aren't able to for whatever reason the other person can say it and that is fine that's not there's there's no issue with that um, okay, but in our case as well, the person who's even if the person who is saying kiddush did not uh, did not drink the the requisite amount for whatever reason they didn't know or they whatever it is, but somebody else according to opinion that somebody else can drink, so they've still fulfilled the obligation of kiddush. They've they've still fulfilled the obligation because that's somebody there drank, right? So that's why. So let's see the Shulchan Aruch summarizes. Let's see, brings all three opinions. Source number 31, the bottom of page 75. It says, The one saying Kiddush didn't taste the wine. But it might be his, uh, also, you know, you have all sorts of cases, it's a diabetic, you can't drink grape juice, whatever it is. Uh, and somebody else drank from the from the wine. Okay, that was the middle opinion that we saw. Men or, women? Eight, Men or women. What? Men or women who tasted. Men or men, men or women, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be a difference because both are equally obligated. The According to this opinion, we one person has to drink the mlolugmav by themselves. It doesn't uh, count that two people uh, together drink it. Okay, this is the source for our practice. That mitzvah best for everybody to taste a little bit of the kiddush, but it's not actually uh, strictly required. That, that's opinion number one. Now the yeshomrim. There are those who say the kevan sheben kulam tamukim lo lugmav yatsu the shtiat kulam is tarefed lekshiul that when everybody together has drunk and lo lugmav that would come together for a shiul. Now we know when we read the Shulchan Aruch when he quotes one opinion and then he says yeshomrim so it's called stam veyeshomrim. Generally speaking, the nachah follows stam follows the first opinion. If he says yeshomrim veyeshomrim then we follow the second yeshomrim but yeah it's only uh, the, those are the the kalipsika of, of the shulchan Aruch. but seemingly based on that we would think that w- that he actually holds by the first opinion brings the second as a dissenting opinion we'll see we'll see in a moment in some of the acronym and then he quotes the third opinion as well he says okay so this was the first opinion that we saw but it's the third one brought in the shulchan Aruch. That the Geonim say it has to be the one making Kiddush has to drink himself. He says it's good to be concerned for their opinion where possible. Okay, this is only for Kiddush, not for other matters of a Kos Shel Bracha. So for example, I think I mentioned last week as well, a, a classic case where we have a Kos Shel Bracha, where generally speaking, the Makadesh does not drink them, the one who's saying the Bracha does not drink themselves. Is that a Chupa? And will say the bracha of the great bracha, but he won't drink from it. Gives the chatan and the kala, etc. Okay. Now the Mishnah Bura over here, source number thirty-two. We said lachosh ledivrehem, meaning that ideally it's best that the uh, the mekadesh should be the one to drink the melol gemav. He says ainu lezeh lekatchila upediavad hiskimu abelchonim tafilu shtiat kol mesubim mistafin lemelol gemav. Says the Mishnah Rabbi Diyavet, under extenuating circumstances, most Achronim agree that so long as a Malolog Mavin total was drunk by all the people, that is enough. That's the in the cup. In the huh? cup. That's, that's uh, within the cup that he made a bracha on. Right. What happens when you have 12 people around a table and everyone has their own, everyone pours for themselves. And uh, so the, the Baal Bait makes a bracha. 
how does that mitzaref it kol ha so, so, so again, under most in most circumstances, the balabait is making the bracha. He's going to drink the malolug mav, and we don't. We're not going to get into any of these issues. I think if people have got certainly in a case where everybody's got their cup in front of them and it's got a bit of wine in it, it's normally enough to have a malolug mav. Um, yeah. So, 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 so your question is interesting. Your question is based on the last based on the last opinion that said nobody has a malolug mav by themselves. Would it all be able to join together? So, uh, so if it's all from the same from the same cup, certainly yes. If they're from uh, from different cups, that is going to be more of a, that's going to be more of a question. I think that we would say that if the bottle is still on the table and it all came from the same bottle, then that would be uh, that would be okay. It's certainly, as you can hear, it's, it's a bedevid situation, and it's not one that should be allowed in Katrila, But uh, but uh, I think that I, I don't remember now who says it, but I think there is an opinion that if so long as the bottle is still there on the table, they yeah. kind of join, join, join everything together. Um, the same shear holds also true for Havdala. It's the same thing as as Kiddush. It's the same. What what, what do you mean? And the uh, and the people share it and stuff like that. Yeah, it's all the same. Generally speaking, I think by Havdala we say that we, we say that it should be it should be one person drinking, but we'll get to Havdala in, in a future share. Um, now, usually, by the way, the, the Mishnah accepts this opinion, but he have it. Rav Avadeh Yosef, Chazon Avadeh, he actually does not, does not accept it. He says, source number 33, based on what we said before, he says, He says, he says 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 he he understands the Shulchan Aruch, he says even he says he says it has to be one person by themselves, uh, drinking the the melolug mav, um, okay. And finally, the Shmach Shabbat Kilchata number thirty four. He says, if a person is unable to drink the melolug mav by himself, best is he should give it to somebody else to drink. Uh, right? It should be uh, one person that should drink it, and it's only but ever that we rely on this uh, on this other opinion. Okay. Something else which comes up here. We have a little bit more time, so we'll maybe talk about. Uh, and next week there's no shear I already mentioned right just a reminder next week there is no shear the week after we will finally get to Bezrat Hashem we'll get to Kiddush from Mokom Suda I'm promising for a few weeks but we will get there so um, the Gemara in Psachim so again source number 35 talks about what's called a Kos Pagum that essentially if somebody has already drunk from a cup that is called a Kos Pagum a defective cup whenever we have a Kos Shal Bracha we have a cup of which we're saying a bracha fulfilling a mitzvah. That's called a kosher bracha. The Gemara says there are ten uh, conditions, ten things you need for the kosher bracha. One of them is not is that people should not have drunk from it before. This is the reason, by the way, going back to Pesach, Pesach again, right? Everybody remembers that when we get to the ten plagues, there's some akot. So there is a minhag which many people have to spill a little bit of wine from the cup onto the plate, or to take with your finger, or to spill the cup, different, different minhagim. And then it says in the Haggadah, when you have finished that, you fill the cup up again. Right? And everybody was, oh, we, we, we had so much, why do we need to fill up the cup? It's not because you don't have enough left to drink from. It's because there is a halakha that you have a kos pagum, that if you put your finger into the cup, or you, right, that, that is not, that's a defective cup, that's not fit for a kos bracha. The way that we fix a kos pagum is that we pour more wine into it. And that is okay. So that is the reason why we do that. Because you have less than you had in the first place, or because you stuck your finger in it? Because what? Because you have less now as a result of that, or because you stuck because your finger you pour, out? Because you pulled out from it, or because you... They're not going to be running. If you put your finger in, you think you have to start all over again. Like, not just top it off. Mm -hmm. right? like, no, just, 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 just top it off. Just top it off. You don't have to empty out the cup. Well, I said, but why is it Pagum? Is it Pagum because you put your finger in there, or it's Pagum because there's less in it than when you started? Yeah, it's prob probably both. Probably both. Okay, so... Um, what, so what you're saying is, assuming I make kiddush and I drink something from oh, the cup, yes, and I want to give it to my wife, yes, so she's drinking from uh, a coach pagum. Well, it depends if she's drinking from. If we're going to see it, but that's exactly the question. If you're drinking from the same cup, right? If if the person makes the makes kiddush and drink yeah. from the cup and then gives to somebody else to drink from the same cup, that's okay. But the question would be, if I make kiddush and then I drink directly from the cup. It's now a kos pagum because I drank from it. And I now take that cup and pour into another cup. I've now poured from a kos pagum. That's a problem. So how do we get, so how do we get around this? So says the Rosh in source number 36. He says, 
right? He says that the person making kiddush doesn't need to pour into the cup of every other person. Uh, so long as the cups are not pukumim. אבל אם היו פגומים, צריך לשפוך מכושר ברכה לתוך כוס וכוס קודם שישתה המברך. In other words, to, to, to uh, pour before I make the bracha. I, what we see here from the Rosh, he says with this halacha, of course, pagum applies not just to my cup, I as the one who's making kiddush, but to the cups of everybody who's also going to drink. The Ra'a, in source number 37, he says, no, no, no. This, cup, this only applies to the cup of the one who is drinking. But the Shulchan Aruch follows, follows the Rosh. So you see source number 38. He says, In other words, in other words, if everybody has before them a cup, if I'm pouring cups for everybody in a small cup, it doesn't matter, uh, before I make Kiddush, so that's fine. That's not a cost per gloom. Nobody's drunk from it yet. Nobody stuck their finger into it. Hopefully, right? There's only another seven. Um, and then that's, I don't need, in, in other words, I don't need to pour from the cup over which I'm saying Kiddush into everybody else's cup. I can pour from the bottle into every cup before Kiddush. Everybody has the cup in front of them. That is fine. That is uh, satisfactory. If somebody has stuck their finger into the cup or they, or, they, or they drank from the cup or whatever it is, then I'm going to need to pour, again, I'm going to need to pour the wine from the cup or from the bottle into it. The um, This is, yeah, David's question in source number 39, the Shara Tzion, he addresses directly. He says, If everybody is drinking from the same cup, even though it's been drunk from before, Mikre mikoshe eno pagum. That is not called a kos pagum. That is okay. The chashuvin ke mekadesh gufa. Everybody is uh, drinking from the same uh, cup. That's fine. Rak she shofech mikoso le kosan ba'inan she shofech kodem she shte batzmo. If you're pouring from the cup into other cups, then I need to pour from it before I drink because otherwise I'm pouring from a kos pagum. And that's what the, what the Rosh says. So source number 40, just a summary in, in English. How do we do this? Different ways of uh, making sure that it's not, well, not uh, pouring a uh, kos pagum. He says, when one makes kiddush for others, it's desirable that each participant partake of the kiddush wine. Again, this is what we saw in the Mishnah Bura. It's not strictly required. If a person who's not making kiddush doesn't want to, doesn't want to drink any wine, that is fine. Again, it's fine for everybody to have a little bit, but it's uh, acceptable also not. But preferably the wine they are given should not be pagum. Therefore, the person who said kiddush should not pour from the cup he drank into the listener's cup, but should do one of the following uh, practices. Number one, after completing Kiddush, but before drinking wine, you can pour from the Kiddush cup into a second cup. Right? Some people do this. Um, if that, if you do that, however, you need to make sure that a Revis remains in the cup from which you drink. Okay. Do you drink a Malolog Mav? And then from the second cup, which nobody has drank from, I can then pour into the cups of all the other participants. Or another way to do it, he mentions, yeah, so drink a Malolog Mav from the original Kiddush cup, and then pass that cup around to the other people. Um, again, if it's not just a close family and there are many people around the table, there are for obvious reasons that you might want to avoid uh, you might want to avoid that. Another way, which is not mentioned, yes, as I said before, if everybody has their own cup, and if it's, it can be poured from the bottle or from the cup before I make Kiddush, and everybody has a small cup in front of them, that is also uh, that is also acceptable. That would not be a cost bagum. Okay, so Ad Khan for today. Next week, no share, the week after Kiddush Makom Sudab is Rat Hashem. And I think with that, we'll conclude Ilchot Kiddush until we we'll get on to Ilchot uh, Sudan, Nechemishna, etc. Have a great day, everybody, and a great week. I have a question. Have a question. Hold, on. Yes. Hold on a second. Can we assume that you, we can make Kiddush of Abchala on Friday night if you don't have wine? Is that correct? You can make Kiddush on Abchala over. Uh, on Friday night, over if you don't have uh, wine, right? Again, so we discussed that last week, and I feel that we have a from the previous shirim. But again, the, if one does not have wine or grape juice and, is, and doesn't have access to that, then on Friday night you would make kiddush over chala. Again, you would still say the exact same formula. The difference would be instead of saying break ragef, and you would say hamotzilachim in aretz. You would wash before, as we've discussed. There are opinions in the rishonim that say that one could do that whenever they want and might be preferable. But nowadays, it's not the practice. Extenuating circumstances. One does not have wine or grape juice, then one could make a Kiddush over the challah on Friday night. As we mentioned also, Shabbat day would be different. 
Shabbat morning, if one doesn't have wine, so then another beverage would be chamar medina, beer, or, or whiskey, or so, so something else, uh, alcoholic, preferably. Okay. Now, Shabbat itself, you can also make kiddush of a whis of a liquor, right? Hard liquor. Yeah, so, so we, we discussed that in previous yeah. shirim, and, 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 and it's in the book. I think that was last week's uh, yeah. shirim. Sure. Okay, signing off. His last week's episode. Last week's episode. <laughs>